Hello there, you're welcome along to Golf Weekly. If you have downloaded the podcast on Thursday, if you're watching on our social channels, or indeed if you're listening to the radio on a Sunday afternoon, you are most welcome. The guest today is a Waterford man who is forging his career on the PGA Tour. Seamus Power is going to join us very shortly. In the meantime, Nathan Murphy is here. Hello. How are you? Very well. Fionn Davenport in Manchester. Hello. Hey, Joe. No Peter Lorry today. He is prepping for the reopening of Spawell Driving Range, Monday morning, 10 a.m. Get along, support the business in the next while. I'm sure lots of you are desperate at golf balls and many a back garden has been decimated. So golf is one of those things, Nathan, which is getting back up and running over the next week or so. I expect that the grass at Spawell will be Augusta-like, <laughs> considering how much time Peter has spent uh, away from his family over the past couple of months, just fine-tuning things. But yeah, a small sense of normality returning. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of weeks when golf does return, how different people find that experience. I'm uh, really regretting giving up my membership. Would you have been within the 5K? Well, if you, give us the, you, know, you go across the mountain, kind of, possibly. The bird flies. Are you within 5K? No, I'm, not, I'm nowhere close. I'm, nowhere right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be absolute paddy last into that golf club. 20th of July is when I'll Oof. be allowed in. Now, anecdotally, I have talked to people who I would say are in a similar vicinity to me, and I've pointed out, Jesus, it's a pity for us we're not going to be able to play until 20th of July. And their response has been a little bit, you know, come on, 5K, 15K, 20K. Does it really matter? The golf club is open. So I suspect the lure of a golf club will be too much for people to resist. Mm. I will be interested to see what the reaction of the guards is. Like, is it going to be so extreme that they're literally camped outside some golf courses, stopping people on the way in? Maybe it is. Like, I, know, I don't know about you, but going in and out to the office every Thursday, I've been stopped pretty much every single week yeah. asking where I was going. And if people are going to be abusing it, you would imagine it'll get known very quickly. Like, do people call each other out? You go, well, I know you don't look, live here. You know, I'm, I'm out playing with my dad, who's 78, and you've come from 25 kilometers away. How does that work? Like, that is part of socially as we all adjust to a sort of new normal, how we react to other people who do break the rules when you're sticking with the rules. But you're Joe Malloy, and you know, you're just no ordinary. You're well respected broadcaster, Joe Malloy. You know, Caesar's wife must be seen to be above reproach. Well, I've just admitted that I'm outside the 5K zone now. So yeah. if I turn up. What you, what you should have done, Joe, is gone. Yeah, I was really glad that I moved to the vicinity of Kaleen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This I live on. house. <laughs> what, are, what are the chances? I did like that idea that they had been thrown around, but uh, obviously isn't coming to pass of if you were a GUI member. So if you had a handicap for these first few weeks, you could play at the club closest to you, mm. which was, uh, I think, quickly, I'd imagine, by some of the more expensive courses. Shot down. Well, I, I presume there's actually going to be a lot of a lot of golf courses, particularly in, in rural areas. Like I think back where I'm from in Ballyhonas, like the club itself is almost, I would say, 5K, if not slightly over from the town. Yeah. And even then, how many people live in the town? I would say maybe a quarter of their membership. Uh, luckily, listener Emmett Kane lives right beside the golf course, so he'll be just fine. Well, of course That's it is. Emmett Kane. I would presume the vast, 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 vast majority of golf club members right across the country, not least in Dublin, are all outside of the 5K. Hmm. So we'll have to see how well it's observed. Luckily enough, in the UK, we don't have any such problems. Uh, golf courses reopened yesterday to members. No limit or restrictions uh, on how far you can travel to play. The only restrictions we have is that you can only play in two balls and you have to maintain social distancing at all times. The clubhouses themselves will be closed. The bars will be closed. You can literally rock up, play, and then go home again. Uh, so I'm on the timesheet for tomorrow. And that's, oh. uh, although it was curious, I watched the thing this morning. So tennis and, and golf were the two sports that opened up yesterday. But here, this is a curious one for anyone who does play tennis. You can't pick up the ball with your hand. You have to use your racket, you know, to kind of, you know, double tap on it, to lift it up. And there's no serving because that would involve you holding a ball in your hand. So you can lob the ball up with your racket and then just kind of underhand it over the court. That's yeah. interesting. I was wondering about it. My dad plays tennis. I was making that very point to him. I was suggesting you'll have to use your own balls for your own service games. But I guess that works fine too, not serving. Like it's really just to get back playing in any kind of way. 
So tennis now, I presume... have taken a different approach though, because tennis aren't allowing the over seventies back. Okay. Whereas oh, golf, right. it seems, are or certainly there's been no mention of whether or not, as long as they're inside the five k radius. Okay. Well, so that's happening this week. There is live golf this weekend on your TV. It's a charity match: Roy McIlroy, Dustin Johnson versus Ricky Fowler and Matthew Wolf. This is a three million dollar skins game. Taylor made heavily involved. It will be on PGA Tour, NBC Sports, and Sky Sports, so you can watch that. To be followed next week by Tiger versus Phil with Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. I'm saying now I'm not overly interested in this match, but I'll probably give it a cursory glance over the weekend. The interesting news, because I know, Nathan, a couple of weeks ago, you were wondering what shape the PGA mm. Tour return might take, and we'll talk to Seamus Power very shortly, but Rory McIlroy has given the whole thing a bit of an impetus. He has said, and the plan is to return on June the 11th in Texas, he's going to play the first three events. So he's going to play the Charles Schwab Challenge in Texas. The following week, they go to Hilton Head in South Carolina. And then the following week, we have the Travelers Championship in Connecticut. McElroy said, I missed the competition, missed the buzz of getting into contention. And I also missed the locker room. I missed the people. So suddenly, those three events, which may not have had McElroy in normal times, are off to a seriously good start. That suggests this thing will be very watchable and significant as opposed to 50 players, a lot of them lower down, no top players playing. So that's, that's a, a really good development for the tour. For the tour, it's huge, yeah. I, I definitely expected that a lot of players would sit out the first few weeks and just see the lay of the land and how safe it all ends up being. But the fact that McElroy maybe there was a sign there when he signed up to play for this charity tournament that he just wanted to get back out there. And likewise, you see Shane Lowry on, on his Instagram is out on the course every day practicing that life somehow is returning to some sort of normality in, in Florida and around America and they're going to go and play. And clearly they've been given enough assurances. They obviously have very good personal doctors, I'm sure, who are giving them advice as well. And they feel that they can implement social distancing uh, yeah we're always talking about being in the locker room i wouldn't be spending too much time in the locker room yeah yeah it's true well it was a good piece in golf channel where they outlined how mm. it's going to look there's a, the players have been sent like a 37 page document with all the protocols so they'll be you know tested when they land on the flight uh, testing before and during the weeks all the players will be asked to use one or two hotels for the week so if you want to stay in a rented house you need special dispensation they want to put them all together in a hotel in effect, have a tournament bubble. And then if you play in Texas and you're going on to play at Hilton Head, you don't travel privately. So a transfer plane has been organized, which will take the players to the next tournament that they're, if they are playing on. No family, no agents, no early week interviews, no Wednesday pro-am. Swing coaches are allowed there, but they'll be at a designated station that you go over and, and, and stand in. Uh, they just sanitize their hands after every hole, all of this sort of stuff. So they, it's fairly detailed and comprehensive, and if you if you test positive at any stage, you uh, withdraw from the tournament immediately and you finish in last place, and that's how they're going to go about it. Yeah. What is the acceptable level of collateral damage? I guess is the question facing all sport, hmm. of how many people are having to work in those hotels that all the players are staying in who... I presume can't quarantine themselves then for weeks on end and have to go back home to their families. And what happens if, well, I guess we've seen this in the Bundesliga. Maybe this is one of the surprising things that I didn't think. I sort of thought once one person within a group tested positive, that that it's sort of almost like with the Bundesliga where 10 players tested positive, that that'd be the end of it. But actually it seems we're going to plow on. If you test positive, you withdraw. Maybe if somehow they look at the rest of your pairing and who you've been close to. And if they're not feeling well, they all withdraw. But aside from that, it seems they're just going to plow on. But yeah. like, the big question mark is what if something goes horribly wrong? Who's responsible? PGA Tour, ultimately. I mean, you can argue players haven't formed consent and that is true. But yeah, that, that, that's the fear. If you're an administrator now in those sports, you are just fearing that kind of news and how it will look. But it's it, not the players. Like, it's not the players. The players are probably best positioned because of their wealth as much as anything else to isolate themselves from as many people as possible and come into contact with very few people. There's just an awful lot of people around who are going to have to work in this who mm. won't have that luxury. Mm. It was interesting on the point you make about if somebody tests positive, if a player tests positive, because at UFC 249 
last weekend in Florida. One of the Brazilian fighters, Souza, mm. was his second name. He tested positive on the eve of the fight. And there was video footage everywhere of him at the hotels, high-fiving other fighters, next to fighters, you know. And he tests positive on the eve of the fight. So as you said, it's not like everything is shut down. He just has his fight cancelled and all the other fighters are tested. And it's, it's business as usual. That seems like the only way it's going to work because if one test shut the whole thing down, one test, we're, we're going to have positives. You know, I, I think a regular thing over the next couple of months as we return to sport will be player X has tested positive. Mm. So he's out of the weekend. He'll be back in two or three weeks' time. If it was going to be a case that it would shut down the whole thing, there'd be no point in starting. So that's where they are, June 11th. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Fionn? It's like maybe it is the fact that all of this is still so new and we're only nine, ten weeks into it that in nine, ten weeks' time, we'll all be a bit more accepting that we have to take a, some risk to go about mm. with our general life. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely the case. Or it would seem to me that that's going to be what's happened. It's not about zero. It's, it's about how, what is the level of acceptable risk and acceptable damage that anything can, can absorb before it calls for an immediate shutdown. Because as both of you have pointed out, if the likelihood of one test is like, must be very, very, very high, one test being positive. So surely in planning, they have absorbed all of this and they're willing to say, okay, right, uh, we have provisions in place for anyone who does test positive, but the threshold at which we're going to call the whole thing off has to be higher than an individual test or whatever it is. And, and that kind of, particularly in the U S when you look at what the, I was going to say the prevailing attitude, but it's not really the prevailing attitude where you still have a majority in favor of lockdown restrictions, et cetera. But there is this massive impetus uh, to kind of start cranking up the wheels of this economy. And, you know, in, in strictly sporting terms, the PGA is, this is the economy of the PGA. They have to start getting tournaments up and running, and otherwise they lose all their income. The sponsor get tons of money, uh, don't get anything return on their investment. So all of these things matter. And to go back to the earlier point, I wonder if I mean, of course, each individual golfer is is, is self employed person, so it's up to them whether they want to play or not. But I wonder um, whether there was whether the PGA leaned on some of the top stars and said, "Look, it would be brilliant." Mm if you could be part of this early start because we need like as joe as you pointed out it's not much fun watching an event with like the the, the lower 40 players in the world who frankly aren't household names and maybe aren't of interest to anybody but their own immediate circle so if you have one or two big names starting in these early tournaments it's it's it helps kind of push that tournament into into the foreground so yeah uh, the the other side is as hopefully this does resume and goes okay and we can get towards potentially some sort of major championship season is what happens with the international players. So pictures in the paper today, Tommy Fleetwood was out at his local course yesterday. He's obviously still in England. He faces 14 days of quarantine if he goes to America. Mm. And when he decides to go back to England, faces 14 more days mm. yeah. of quarantine. So like, do those players who aren't in America, like, do, they, do they go now? Or, again, are they going to wait and see? Are they going to think, actually, it's just not worth it? I don't want to be able to play. We talked about this last week. And at the time, now, as we all know, is everything changes day to day. You know, the reality is shifting all the time. But that the PGA have calculated um, that of the international players that aren't, cur- you know, fully resident in the U.S., it's surprisingly not a huge number of them. I, I can't remember the number, but it was like, you know, I think it was like 30 players or 40 players or something like that. Tommy Fleetwood being one of them. But when you have like your likes of Rory's in Florida, Ian Poulter, et cetera, et cetera. So there are still a big chunk of international players who are based in the US. And so that the, the effect isn't, the impact rather, isn't going to be as dramatic as perhaps we thought beforehand. Well, let's talk to a man who's on the front line, in effect, when it comes to this story. Seamus Power is going to join us in just one second. PGA Tour uh, player with us in just one moment. So as mentioned, Seamus Power joins us. We know you're stateside, Seamus. Uh, where in the world are you? I'm in South Carolina at the moment. Staying in the old warm South Carolina. 
I was, I, golf is, has been deemed an essential activity in that part of the world, hasn't it? You actually have been able to golf during this whole crisis. I have. It's been so like I live in North Carolina most of the time, and yeah, it was one of the the, the rules in the in the US are funny. Yeah, it, it was. It was deemed essential, um, so it stayed open every course and stuff made some changes like you you know you weren't touching the pins they would uh, a lot of the courses had like like uh, styrofoam stuff in the cups your ball kind of stayed on top and you just pick it up and away you go um, but for the most part it was open and kind of not a problem which is um, I mean it's great like other states even down here in South Florida and California and different states over here closed golf courses but I was looking in North Carolina um, so I was able to stay nice and busy kind of throughout all this we were talking to Shane Lowry about five, six weeks ago, who's obviously in Florida, and he hadn't picked up a club in, in weeks at that stage. I know he's back out in the course now. Uh, it, there's part of you thinking there's a lot of golfers who want to play at a lot of golf and might be a little bit rusty going back, and you're just going to be cruising on through when the PGA Tour does return? Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm definitely looking that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, they were shut down for a while. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it definitely could be. I got some really good practice done, but there's still enough of a gap, I think, where guys will be okay. But then I did see last night that in is it Los Angeles County or something they extended the stay at home by three months or something. So I don't know if there's anyone stuck there. That's obviously going to be a tricky thing. But no, I, I think I said I, I've definitely been more fortunate than most guys. Um, I mean, I said I've been practicing away like crazy, been staying sharp, um, and like I'll definitely be ready to go when time comes. But I, I'm sure I'm sure like the Shane. I mean, it, it's like another off season and three four weeks to get ready is more than enough for most guys. How has North South Carolina fared with COVID? I mean, it's interesting. It's not as shut down as other places. Has it been badly hit? Are the numbers really high, or is it is it come out no, relatively no. unscathed? Rel- like, I mean, relatively unscathed, I guess. I mean, still, um, I don't know. I think in North Carolina, the number of cases was maybe fifteen to fifteen to twenty thousand type thing, but not too bad. I mean, like Charlotte, the city. I mean, I mean. The greater Charlotte metropolitan area has 2.2 or 3 million people. Um, and North Carolina would probably have more people than it does in Ireland even. So it's like not too bad, mm. at least compared to – in that's why, it's, I mean, the U.S. is odd like that. I mean, New Jersey, New York, you know, Chicago, Detroit, big cities like, are getting hammered. But some of the lesser populated places haven't been too bad. But then, you know, this whole thing, I don't think anyone seems to know. Like it still seemed rather early to get everything up and running again. But I mean, that's from I obviously no idea what's really going on. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, for the most part, it's been okay. I mean, I only know. I mean, I, I don't know if that means that, but I only I know one person that got it kind of in the Carolinas. Um, so it hasn't been as widespread as as other areas, but obviously still see, feeling the feeling the effects of it. Yeah, it's a very strange time. So we were just talking there about the return to PGA Tour action June the eleventh in Texas. Are you going? Are you playing? I, I won't. It doesn't look like I'm getting in there. So it does, the first two I don't look good for. So the first one's in Texas, in Fort Worth, and the second one's in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Um, and the numbers look a lot of guys, because neither of those two states have been hit particularly badly. I think guys are more willing. The next couple of weeks after that, I'll be interesting. It's in Connecticut, in the Northeast, and in Detroit, which have been two of the worst hit areas. And you can see it in the commitment numbers. I mean, I'm 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 in. I think I'm borderline for travelers, but I'm well in the field in Detroit. So that that's kind of where I'm hoping. It's kind of bizarre. I mean, with my conditional status, the summer was originally going to be my busy stage, but now I'm not really sure. After such a break, guys are going to play these events that they wouldn't have necessarily played before. So, on more than likely, my first couple of events are going to be on the the Corn Ferry Tour, at least the first couple. Um, knowing that I won't get in for PJ Tour events and you know, it'd be nice to rock, knock off some rust and just kind of get up and going again and get into the feel of it and into the kind of in the bit of momentum going. Is any part wanna... of you concerned about going back out? And even though these are going to be behind closed doors events, it seems like with the numbers involved still somewhere up near a thousand people they feel in or around a golf course over the course of the week. As you say, you're in a part of the world that hasn't been massively affected, having to go play golf in a part of the world that has been seriously affected. Have you had to think long and hard about whether you go or is this your life and you just got to do it? Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that worries me, and it's not something that you kind of see brought up, is I don't think they quite know the long-term effects of this thing. Yet. Like, I've, I've read some things where, like, there's possibility of, like, lungs being pretty badly damaged long-term, which would obviously would be kind of a scary thing. Um, 
I mean, the tour, they gave us like a 37 page booklet, you'd call it the other day, on the precautions we're going to take. And they're pretty extensive. But, you know, the, the chances are there's going to be a thousand people, and you're going to be a thousand people in Texas, and then moving all the way across the country to South Carolina, and then up to, you know, it's inevitable that some people are going to start getting it. Um, so it definitely is, it is some bit of a worry. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose I understand the fact that at some point they're going to have to get back into it and this worry. It doesn't seem like it's going to go away anytime soon. So I think they're, they're aware of that. I mean, even waiting another two months, like they're looking at it going, they don't really know if that's going to help at all. I mean, they're talking about a second kind of coming of it in the, in the, like the fall months over here in America. So I, I guess they're, they're probably realize that at some point they're kind of going to have to start and there is going to be some risk and keys to mitigate it, I guess, as best as possible. Seamus, in this 37-page document, is there any instruction that will directly impact on the actual playing of a golf round in a pro tournament as in you mentioned that in practice rounds you have styrofoam in the cup so and you're not meant to be taking the flags out are they going to do is there any changes going to happen not particularly i mean there's going to be a bit more it's going to be quite a bit on the caddy so like the caddy when player interaction is going to be unusual because they're you know they're, they're telling us you still need to social distance so your kind of player caddy thing is going to be a little different, and the player and the caddy is going to be responsible for cleaning the flags, cleaning the rakes, and clean, keeping the club sanitized throughout the round. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. Like I, when I heard about all these precautions coming in, I was like, I don't know how like how doable this is going to be. But honestly, after reading it, they're obviously quite extensive. But there's none of them that are undoable. You know, you're kind of going to have to be pretty diligent. And like, there's a lot of different things, and the warm the warm up beforehand, like they're going to. I mean, things like that are going to be strange. There's going to be set stations, like, you know, two meters apart on the driving range and, like, things like that. And there's going to, like, it's going to be a bit of a, a bit awkward or whatnot. But I, I do think it will be doable. Um, so that part was kind of pleasant reading. It's just going to be, take a lot of, in, the danger with this stuff is it doesn't take any more than a handful of people not to do things properly and it could mess it up for everyone. Because that's, I mean, that's obviously the biggest fear, you know, the first tournament back and, you know, everyone gets tested after Friday or Saturday round and three of the guys in the top five or something fail a test and all of a sudden they're pulled out of their tournament. And, you know, it kind of makes it look like, a, like I don't know what you, like, it would just look a bit ridiculous almost, you know, guys start just being pulled off the leaderboard. So that's going to be, that's going to be the big thing. I think a lot of it's going to be on the players and caddies to do all the little things, you know, like everyone's been trying to do over the last couple of months. You know, when we're at tournaments, we're not going to be allowed to go out to bars and restaurants to eat. They're going to encourage you to get like room service almost exclusively um, and not, I mean, just being, you know, being responsible and being as careful as you can. I mean, the risk is going to be there, but you can certainly reduce risks by, you know, acting smart and doing the things that they're asking us to do. In terms of your life out there over the last while, who, who's family, who are you with? How are you spending your time? Are there kids on the scene? What, what, what's, what's day-to-day life away from practicing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, they, like away from practice, it's been quiet. I mean, so I like I, I have an apartment in Charlotte. And I, I, got, I live with a good buddy there, so that part of it's been actually it's been pretty enjoyable. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't fancy being in a place by myself. Don't have any kids or anything like that. So it's been you know the evenings are are quiet. But I said I've been lucky. I mean, every day I'm busy until five or six o'clock between practice and gym stuff. So it's not too bad. I don't have you know getting out in the fresh air and the weather has been beautiful here. And so being able to out and practice and kind of just get out and about and evening time still feel a bit bizarre you're just kind of you know you just realize you're kind of stuck then in, inside but I said I know that's a lot better than most people so I really I kind of kind of much to complain about really yeah that American twang of yours is getting ever more strong mm-hmm. I know <laughs> I know I need my I, I need my caddy Simon to get back over here and give me uh, teach me back some uh, some Irish Irish accent <laughs> how long have you been out there now I know you went to East Tennessee wasn't it and you, you turned yeah. pro in 2011 so I guess geez well over a decade yeah I mean I started I, I think I flew to the US August 24 2006 was when I went to when I went to college originally so it'll be a few months time it'll be 14 years on and off yes mm-hmm. I mean it's amazing where the time geez the time goes by so fast it's scary um but yeah so be, yeah I've been here been here a long time now um yeah. but you know, again, for, for, what I'm, for what I'm doing, I still feel like I'm kind of in the best place for myself, but it definitely hurts the old accent, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know, like, so you're 33 now. In most other sports, yeah. you would be looking at retirement. So you, I know. I, I think golfers get a real sense of, my God, how quickly it goes. Yeah, yeah, you really, really do. Because, I mean, I mean, in golf terms, I mean, they're like 31 to 37 or 8 are almost your prime years, really. And as you said, in most sports, 
33, they're, they're like some teams looking to push you out the back door at 33, and you're like, but it, it's it's just different, you know. I, if anything, I feel better now than I have. I mean, you just learn so much about kind of what you need for golf, and it's just it's not the same as other sports where you need to be, you know, fittest and most explosive to play your best. You know, so much of it is about experience and about your mental strength and stuff like that, which you almost, you don't, for at least someone like me, you don't really have in your early 20s, you know. Some of these kind of, like, phenom guys seem to have it, but um, it's it's different for everyone. And, yeah, so I hopefully got several good, good uh, years left me. Are you very much set on the PGA Tour? I know you were back in Ireland last year and you played the Irish Open down in La Hinge for the first time in, in quite a number of years. It, like, is your life in America or is there an appeal to coming back to Ireland and, and basing yourself on, on the European Tour for a couple of years? Like, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do it a lot. I mean, most European guys, you'd love to play both circuits. Um, but, you know, until I started getting some wins or started getting to the top 50 in the world, that's just us. It's very, it's, it's just not doable, really. Like you'd end up losing both your status in both places. So hopefully, you know, if I could really, if I could really get going, and you know, when it was a case where I could get the, I'm not sure the number of the tournament, the the minimum number of tournament requirement is in Europe anymore. But you know, if you could get both starts and you could, you know, have exemptions over here where you'd have more freedom to go play there. Like I'd, I'd love, absolutely love to do that. I mean, you'd love to play golf all over the world. Um, so we'll see, we'll see long term. But I mean, right now. It's just for me. To, for me, the last couple of years trying to hold on to one job has been hard enough. So. <laughs> trying to hold on to two now will be a bit of a struggle. Yeah. On, on, on that front, to jog people's memories, so you turn pro in 2011. You get onto the PGA Tour in 2017. That's your rookie season. Uh, 2018, I think you make the Fed, FedEx playoffs in 2018. Uh, yeah, six, then, six, six, seven, yeah, 17, 18 season I did. Yeah. Yeah. 2019. You managed a fifth and a sixth place finish, your best finishes in the PGA Tour, but you finished one, two, six in the standings. So for this year, your fourth year, you mentioned conditional status. Does that basically just mean you take every event that you can get and it's contingent on whether the Rory McIlroy's of the world decide to play that week or not? Is that the gig? Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. So I like in my status, I'll get in all the smaller events, like the the ones that you, you wouldn't even have heard of. Like, I'll get in the tournaments all opposite the majors, there's, or most majors. There's, like, a smaller tournament opposite those ones. And then, like, this, the lesser ones, whatever. Like, there's still – I mean, that's the beauty of the PGA Tour. There's still seven, seven $7.5 million purses, but it wouldn't be – big-name guys wouldn't have any interest. Like, you'd have ones like – the one like – John Deere, for example, is one. And, you know, there's a bunch of tournaments like that where like the Byron Nelsons want to take like one, they're really big tournaments and every, they're normal events, but they just, the way they fall in the schedule that the likes of, you said Rory and those big name guys are either preparing for a major or there's two or three big events before or after. And so I get in all those ones, but you have plenty of opportunities. I mean, on a normal year, you would get in, you know, 15 kind of minimum if you played well, maybe 18 to 20. So you still have lots and lots of opportunities. Same Peter Lowry right uh, usually guest presents on this show as well. He's not with us today, but he's spoken brilliantly at times about the stress of life on the bubble, fighting for your card, and particularly going back to Q school, and also sitting at home on a Sunday night or a Monday morning and getting a call saying, you're in, and having to fly yeah. halfway around the world. And obviously the expense that comes with that, and then trying to justify that expense, even though you're yeah. part of the practice and everybody else, and somehow perform at your best on a Thursday when all the yeah. odds are stacked against you. When you were playing in normal times for the first few events of the year, how did you cope with that, that stress and, and the not knowing? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's stressful, but it, it's, it's a funny, like you'd prefer, as all, I mean, you'd prefer to be in normally and make your schedule. But for me, that's just not, that's just not realistic, like at least this season. You know, if I can, if I play better, it becomes a, it becomes a realistic thing. But as I said to be like, I've had the last couple of years where, like I had full status last year and I did my least amount of points that I did on my, three years on tour so it's it's much more about quality rather than quantity and it's kind of just to keep that in mind but it's also easier in the pga tour because i mean european tour is tough i mean as you said peter could get a call and he has to go to who know like anywhere around the world i mean the european tour is tough going like that we're in the u.s like i'm in charlotte i, I mean there's no place in the country that i can't get on a flight and go non-stop and be there in four hours you know so it makes a big difference on that on that end too but it's not it's not the ideal situation but I, I i think you just have to get in your mind that it's that's the way it's going to be until you until you kind of play where you play your way into full status or you get a win or something like that and then you can kind of pick and choose and do what you want to do you mentioned last year was your toughest year at the lowest number of points 
accumulated. Give us the story of last year. What happened? Did you lose your game or just a bit unlucky or what, where were you? Yeah, no, I just struggled. I mean, you'd love to say a bit unlucky, but no, I just struggled. It was a funny season. I, did, I was at a horrible start, like all the way through the West Coast, which is, I mean, probably 12 tournaments in. I played very, very poorly. And then I played kind of decently. The players got me going. And then I had a very good run where I finished um, like sixth, fifth, and 13th, I think three weeks in a row, which I got the majority of my points for the year. And then the rest of the summer was okay. Like I made lots of cuts. Like I made my last or seven, my last eight cuts for six and last, but I was finishing, you know, 40th and 45th. And you just don't get enough points doing that. It's just, it's the points are top heavy. And that's, you just, you know, one top 10 finish is better than eight events finishing like 40th, you know? So it's, it was, it was a weird season. I just, I had that one little purple patch. And I, I did have opportunities in those events to to really make some extra points, but I just didn't I didn't play very well to be honest. I I don't really have any grand excuse other than that. I was just struggled, dug myself a massive hole, then dug myself out of it, and but then wasn't able to keep it keep it going after that. So um, yeah, that's why I ended up in a conditional ball. Famous, can I can I ask you? You changed coach. Was it a year ago? You changed coach. I've changed a couple of times actually. So I yeah I worked with Justin Parsons starting last. February in Riviera yeah. I, I met Justin I worked with Justin until like this January and then I actually I switched back to a coach I used when I played my best golf on the mini tour in my first kind of year on the first couple of years on the web on the was the web.com at the time so just to be based in Charlotte I think that seems to suit me a little better when I have a little bit more access to them and it's kind of close by where I can just you know if I'm struggling a little bit I can just kind of go over there and have a look for 20 minutes and then kind of head away again um, okay yeah it's tough I mean you know, I, I always say to people like you know, you never you never want to change coaches, but if you don't feel like it's you feel like it's not working, it's tough when to know when to pull the trigger or pull the plug because you don't want to go too soon if you think it's on the right track. But you mm -hmm. also, again, in my boat, like when you're really trying to hold on to your job, you don't want to wait too long, and then you know if you wait a bit too long, you really can play or play away out of any kind of status. So it, it's a tricky thing. But no, I, I said it's been going very well at the moment, so I'm kind of excited now to get back into it. Can I, can I read you a quote from, well, you're now ex-coach Justin Parsons, who uh, he said, it was a relief to him to discover that some of the puzzling bad shots he was hitting were beyond his control because of his posture, and he's starting to produce some great results. Now, I know you're six foot three, but you're an experienced golfer. Talk to us about what, what was it with your posture? Yeah, there, there was a couple of physical limitations that I actually kind of found out, which I was unaware of. Um, I had kind of like a I don't know what you'd call it. Like, basically, a, a pretty big tightness, whatever you call it, on the, the left side of my neck and through my left shoulder, which I had, it was only doing certain movements, but it was in particular in the golf swing, keeping my left, it basically was, I was losing the ability to keep my left arm fully extended properly. I would kind of, like, slide my head this, like, away with my left arm because I, I just I did, could, didn't have the extension with the left arm. Um, and then it was weakness in an area in my right hip where, again, it was kind of hurting towards the top of my backswing. But it was interesting. Yeah, it was, it was just through some testing. Um, I, tried to do, I tried to work on a couple of moves I just couldn't seem to make any headway with. And then, you know, once I identified the physical stuff and did some work on it, they almost started falling into place without, work, without actually doing any work on the swing side of it. So it was, it was quite a relief, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, Justin, geez, Justin's brilliant and he's access to all the, I mean, all the, the coolest little equipment you can imagine. So it's, it's amazing what they can kind of tell you nowadays. Mm. So how's the game at the moment? Very good, actually. I am, um, like, it's been, it's actually been quite nice. I mean, like the, the PGA Tour schedule now, you don't really get much of an off season anymore. It goes, I got my car at the end of 16 and you almost, I almost haven't had a break since. So in one sense, at the moment, it, it could be a very, very good thing for me because a couple of things that I wanted to improve and wanted to spend time working on, but you just don't have it anymore. I mean, if anyone knows, I mean, the schedule runs all the way through end of November and then you're starting first week of January. So by the time you, you know, take a week or two off just to unwind and then I'll go, I'll go home for a little bit, you're back and it's a week later you're off to Hawaii again. So you just don't have a chance to do anything. And then, you know, you're just, you're going hell for leather all the way to the end of November again. So it's been going very well. Made a couple of little changes, and and been hitting it very, very nicely in practice and whatnot. Like it's probably nicest it probably it's ever been actually. And um, so I'm really looking forward to it. And um, you know, 
guess it's brilliant to see it in practice and playing like just playing practice rounds. But obviously, the, the true test doesn't. You know, you don't really know the full extent of it until you get back into tournament mode and getting some shots under pressure. Hmm. When you look Is at the w- players, sorry. sorry, Finn. When you look at the players who were fiftieth and sixtieth, say in the FedEx Cup rankings, who are comfortably enough holding on to their cards and and where their game is and and where your game is, like are there things you can identify that they're doing that you need to try and replicate that that would help you get to that level. Yeah, I mean, oh, you, you've got stats for day, stats mm. absolutely for everything nowadays. It's funny, like, it, but it all—it all seems a, when you look at the stats, there's very actually, it's very minute between very say minute. 50th and 126th. Yeah, it re- it really is, and that's. But you have to. I mean, so I've been losing. The disappointing one for me has been my driving. You know, I'm long, but I still like the stroke gain thing. I have negative stroke for the last couple of years, which is for someone who's for someone in the longer part. That's actually very. Well, not hard to do, but it's very disappointing. You should be gaining. I mean, everything we know about the distance thing. So, like, the driving is a big thing. It, it and my my approach, my approach play hasn't been hasn't been good enough. My short game and putting has been pl- plenty good enough to be, you know, competing and being in the top 50, 60 and two are no problem. So that I mean, that's that's been the biggest area that I need to improve, and that's been the kind of one I've been focused on here over the last six eight weeks. Because I was looking at your stats, you're. Averaging this season, where you've had seven events and four miss, uh, made cuts, three missed cuts, you, you're, you're averaging 299.5 yards. That's cruel, isn't it? They couldn't have just rounded that up. Point you rounded up. <laughs> so let's do that for you. You're averaging 300 yards off the tee. And I thought, I thought well, that is long. That is long. But actually, that just puts you 87th on tour. That is the yeah. standard we're talking yeah. about. But your percentage of fairways hit is right down. It is poor, yeah. Yeah, and that's where... I mean that's where the strokes like if you like you're in it, yeah it just it's just it just hasn't been good enough and I've been losing I said strokes versus I mean just like you see I know it's obviously Rory's probably the best driver of all in the world but Rory starts a given tournament eight strokes ahead of the field on driving alone which is absolutely remarkable um, but that's I mean that's obviously the standard you're looking for but someone who does it even someone who's hitting at 300 yards you, you should be in the plus and, and strokes gain. But obviously the accuracy hasn't been there and it's really been hurting. And then, and then it just all feeds from there because, you know, it's hard to get the ball as close to the hole when you're in the rough. It's hard to – and then it's hard, to, it's hard to make birdies when you're, when you're further away from the hole. It's just – I mean, it's just simple kind of yeah. – it's, it's just a knock-on effect that makes a massive difference. It's very interesting because of late, the way it's been talked about on tour, it's that almost uh, distance is everything. Players don't really care if they're not on the fairway, as in the crowds are standing on the rough half the time anyway. So just yeah. bomb it and then gouge it onto the green. And that's talked about as almost the way to play modern golf. So it's actually quite interesting to hear you say that not being on the fairways does hurt. Yeah, it, I mean, it depends. I mean, there's often, often say, like, there's varying degrees of missing a fairway. Like, there's, you know, four yards into the rough and you still have a clear shot, and there's 15 yards into the rough when you're under trees and pitching heavy low shots. So there is varying degrees, but that is definitely a, a thing. But the the tough part is, like, if there's so many guys bombing it that on any given week there's going to be 50, 60 of them, they're going to be hitting it pretty well and hitting a large percentage of fairways. Like, the guys that won't, you can certainly get it around nowadays, but when you get on certain golf courses, you, you really have to be. And again, if you're hitting a 320 and you're four yards into the rough, it makes a big difference too versus 300 in the rough. With all the every 10 yards, it's funny all the stats. I mean, it starts every 10 yards is about 0.6 of a shot. So, like, if you so those the guys are really bombing it like through 320. If I'm in the rough and they're in the rough over the course of a round, they're gonna beat me by 1.2 shots. So, it's all. It's all related. Like that's why, you know, I'm working on getting the speed up a little bit and obviously improving the swing and just again hitting it maybe one more fairway around. But the, the biggest one is the one or two that are going more into into trees and more into more kind of serious trouble where you're kind of pitching out and it's costing you full strokes. They're they're the ones that really hurt. Mm. Are are they easier and by easier air quotes here, easier fixes than say if your putting stats were worryingly low? In that you can get on and you can you can fix whatever mechanics that you need to fix to make sure you make that extra fairway per round, and also you're talking about your approaches. You he famously worked on his wedges inside 120 yards a few years yeah. ago, um, but whereas your putting seems really really solid, so you must you must go into this feeling fairly confident that you could have a good time. Yeah, I mean I, I've. I, I mean, there's obviously, you know, there's degrees to everything, but I, I absolutely think you can, it's easier to improve stuff like that because 
there is you know putting is a putting is a funny thing where it's like there's a lot like you have to be able to read greens and you have to be able to hit putts at the right speed it doesn't matter how much you work on your stroke if you can't read the green properly or mm -hmm. you can't hit the right speed you just don't have a chance where the driver for the most part is just one swing that you're just standing up and you're giving it a rip so there is definitely is an area i think and well, I've also driven it extremely well at times, so I know it's there. It's just trying to get it on a more consistent basis. Mm. It was in, I, I, sorry, Joe. I, I was just going to say, it, it's, it's amazing, you know, the way you reeled off those stats. They are very much to hand in your head. Mm. Is it a good thing to be on the golf course knowing all these things? Yeah, I mean, obviously on the golf course you're not, but it's, 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 very, it's, an, it's a more efficient way to practice with the stats we have now. Like, I mean... The funny one is like is the putting stuff. Like, you know, I was younger, I would spend tons of time hitting three, four foot putts. But like when you get on tour, you cannot make up any ground making three and four foot putts. You just cannot. Everyone makes them. It's <laughs> just there's no like even like the a good putter is not missing any and a bad putter might miss one every ten tournaments. They're just they're just not missed on tour. If you're missing those, you're you're just you, you just you're can you're, you're just you're in so much trouble. So you do, you, you, you realize what the areas that you can make up ground, especially like suiting to suit your game. Um, so that's the interesting thing with the stats. Obviously on the golf course, you're never thinking that. Um, you've, I mean, you've different stats for the golf course that given that week, but no, the general stuff is obviously, it's much more practice oriented. It's like, you know, you can look at it after 10 tournament stretch and realize that, you know, 100 to 125 yards is by far your biggest weakness and you're giving up half a stroke around to, whenever so on so on that thing so that's it's more used for practice and kind of making practice more efficient are you a scoreboard watcher for the most part no i mean if i'm i've often said like if i get late on a sunday it's only matters on certain golf courses if i've got a like tory pines like is a perfect example if i'm standing an 18 fairway tory pines i you know it's definitely worth knowing where you stand in, in relation to the lead but a lot of holes it just doesn't matter you know it, if it's most holes you're going to there's really only one way to play them you know reachable par fives or whatnot might be a little bit of a different different situation so um i look at it but only kind of only when uh like points are that i think I, it might actually benefit me do you think funny. um sorry, sorry i was gonna say do you think I, I don't know how relevant this is in any way at all but that scoring will be higher when golf returns when there's no supporters when you're going back to your difference between five yards and 15 yards that particularly for those marquee groups there isn't somebody to suddenly uh, the ball magically reappears and also you'd wonder is the, the adrenaline level going to be there say on a on a sunday down the stretch of a tournament when it, there's some polite applause potentially if you hit yeah from the shot. cameraman yeah <laughs> I, I think it'll be interesting. Like for someone like me, I don't think it's going to make a massive difference. You know, I'm like, you know, most tournaments, if I'm not up near the lead, I only have you know, a handful of people anyway. But I think for the likes of Rory or Tiger, these guys, it's going to be a bizarre experience. I mean, I mean, I remember playing golf with Rory in the south of Ireland or, Clo or the close, and he would have a thousand people follow him. He probably hasn't played a competitive round of golf without a lot of people following him in, I don't know, like 15 years. So I think it'll be different for someone like him. And I mean, Tiger over the years looks like he feeds off crowds like no, like no one else. I mean, I, I think it'll, it will be a part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, and you see those bigger name guys, you hit it and they hit it and somehow their ball seems to end up in most teams to become the more favorable positions because it hits someone and stops or does kind of things like that. So we'll see. I, I, I don't know. I think it, for the first tournament, you know, it could be a little strange, but I think guys will adapt pretty quickly. Um, you know, barring those top couple of guys, I think most guys would be more used to it than you would think. Seamus, you mentioned Rory there in the south of Ireland. Tell us about the McElroy you saw at that age. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to describe, I remember I had this conversation with my dad. I, I, I would play with Rory, and I often thought of my, like, my own guy. I, I played with him at the south, one, or sorry, the, the close at European club. I'm not sure what year it was, but it was myself. I think it was Darren Crow and Rory. And um, the first round, like, European club was playing so difficult. The cut ended up being, like, one, over 160. It was something crazy. And um, the first round, he was four or five under after about 13 holes. And I remember thinking, like, he's just playing a completely different game to the rest of us. And I always, like, the way I could describe it, to, like, how I would describe him was, like, if I played my best, I thought, always thought I could beat everyone except him. If he played his best there wasn't a way that I was going to be able to beat him. That was going, that was, 
if I played my best and he was a little off, I could beat him. But besides that, it was just he played with such confidence, even at that, even at a young age, and it was just he just just could hit shots that you just you. I certainly wasn't at that age, wasn't able to hit, and I hadn't seen anyone else I was able to hit at that time. So it was it was pretty amazing to watch. Um, I'll always remember that European club. It was a, a I don't even remember what he shot in the end, but he was he was putting on an exhibition there for a while. I just couldn't I couldn't believe that like he'd be hitting driver down holes that I'm kind of standing there hitting two iron because it gets too narrow and he's just standing up hitting driver down a ten yard gap. Mm. It was just something you, it didn't even seem to make sense, but you knew it was kind of special to watch. The uh, the Irish on the European tour uh, have always been been very close, and I know it's a very different setup in America because. Yeah. Uh, it, I think just in terms of how you go about your business and where you're based and things like that, is there a closeness amongst the Irish? Because obviously yourself, Shane, Rory are all quite similar in age and would know each other from that domestic circuit when you were back in Ireland as kids. Yeah, I mean, like, like when, when I'm probably I'd be closer to Shane more when when he when he plays. Um, I, I, I like Rory is. I mean, when I see him and stuff on the punting greens, I'm like, he's still great and he'll still talk to you or whatever. But he's he's so big that it's hard for him to do normal stuff anymore. He's just such a big name. Like you, like he's not like you kind of see him out and he's eating here or he's walking around here or doing anything like that. He's just such a big name that he really can't do the kind of things. I guess probably more not what everyone word like more more normal people can do. I'm sure. To be honest, Shane after winning the Open last summer is probably getting a little bit more like that too. But um, I'd probably be a little bit closer to Shane. I always look forward to when Shane or Podrick or, or, or even Rory are playing. I mean, it's just. You know, I've been in the States a while, but you still can't beat meeting someone from Ireland and just kind of talking about old times and stuff like that. It's yeah. It always uh, yeah, makes you feel a bit, bit more at home. Of the non-Irish players, is there any guys that you're particularly close with? Yeah, I mean, like, there's, there's some great guys. I mean, so Joel Damon is a guy I've, I've known. We kind of got on the web.com tour at the same time, and he's had a great run of form over the last kind of uh, whatever. And then, like, David Hearn, I'm good buddies with. He's, uh, I played at Zurich, the team championship with him. Got to kind of become pretty pretty good buddies with Dave, and then some of the other guys that play, came up on the on the web with like a guy called Trey Molinax and there's a few other guys like that. And um, like the the web.com tour was kind of a fun tour to play. It was much more camaraderie. Everyone was kind of in the same boat, so you kind of develop stronger bonds with some of those guys than you than I have at least with too many guys on the PJ tour as of yet. Yeah, I, I, maybe I maybe the to... sorry. I was going to say maybe the solution to the Ryder Cup dilemma for the US is to have pick 12 players from their web.com tour and have them play the European tour guys. Yeah. And then it might be a little more balanced. Yeah, uh, it is. Is a di- There's a different vibe that way for sure. I mean, even just, I know I don't have a lot of experience playing the European tour, but uh, even just playing the Irish open last year, there's just, it's just a different vibe. The, you know, that a lot of the guys, at least the bigger name guys, the European or the PGA tour kind of travel with their, whatever you want to call it, like, like entourage. They all have, you know, you don't really see them by themselves. And, they're, they're not kind of being themselves, and but then when you know at the Irish Open last year, I mean, everyone was like, even in the players' lounge, everyone was there's much more laughing and joking and kind of hanging out going on. So it's different. There's definitely a different feel, um, but I'm, I'm sure that is a part with the Ryder Cup. I mean, you can just see it, even when, you know, even when guys are playing on the golf course and they're not playing in the team, the European guys look like they're getting getting on a little bit better, and like some of the US guys are so. It's just I think it's just a different. It's just a different kind of approach there. Much they're you know much more driven to individual stuff, and they they can't put it aside for the team things as well as some of the European guys. So what's the protocol? It's funny you brought this up. I wanted to ask you about this anyway because we do hear that the US tour is that lonelier place. The entourages, the travels, the private travel. If you walk into a locker room and Phil's there and Tiger's there and there's a few other top ten guys, is the pro- is it fine for you to go up and say, hey Phil, hey Tiger, what's going on? How'd you play today? Is it is it like that? Oh yeah, I mean, like all those guys will talk away to you for sure. Um, to me, the, they're all chatty. To me, you don't. A lot of the conversations just seem to stay kind of at that like that top level. There's no real depth to a lot of the conversations. There's no, there's not the same. At least, I mean, obviously, I like maybe to me, like I'm an Irish person, so I, I like they, you know, probably view me as an outsider. I, I don't even know, but I, that's that's the kind of the difference. And I think that's just like it's. You know, we grow up, we play a lot of team golf. Like, I mean, when I grow up, like one of your big goals is to make the Munster team and to make the Irish team and stuff like that. And it, it, that's not the same deal. You know, even making Walker Cup, it's a huge deal at home. And you would ask some guys over there and they're like, they don't even know when it's on. Like, that's sort of like, it's just not the same. 
it's not the same. You don't have the same drive to to make these teams growing up, and I, I do think that's part of it. Um, like you know, I remember playing like team golf, even in like European boys and home internationals. And I mean, the team is it's it's like the team is so tight, and it's every everyone's rooting for each other. And I don't think they have that to the same extent. Even in like even in college golf, it's a little different because you're there is also an individual leaderboard and like one of the scores is getting thrown out it's just a, it's not quite as team oriented as is saying a home internationals where every single point is absolutely massive and there is no you know nobody cares if you and your match if the team lost there's none of that versus you know in college like well i think fin- i finished fourth even though the team finished like you know last it doesn't really so it's it's a, just a little different i think mm. a cheap and nasty question aside from rory who's the best that you've played with out there over the last four years uh, I, I played with Brooks the week before he won his first U.S. Open, and it was very impressive. Um, it was just, it, again, it's hard to describe, but it's just a different sound off his ball. And then the mental side of his game was, was the part that just was shocking. Like, he was just could, he just seemed like he was so laid back. I mean, not that we were going to win the tournament, but we were like third or fourth last group on Saturday and Sunday, like, or maybe six or seven last group. Like, we were in decent shape. And he looked like he was, you know, out playing with his buddies and didn't care about a thing in the world. And as well as hitting it very, very, very solidly. So it, that, I thought that was very impressive. And I said it to him at the time, and obviously kind of, you know, hindsight, obviously it seems so smart. But at the time I was thinking, going, like if he's ever in contention in a big tournament, he's going to be very hard to beat. Because he's, he's, I don't know deep down, but certainly on the surface, he looks like he's going to care less than the other person. And those people are extremely hard to beat under pressure. Is he a chatter on the court, like during a round? Yeah. He's, he's, I mean, I, I, like when I was playing with me, I mean, I guess he wouldn't be initiating too much, but he would talk away. He's a very nice guy, very nice guy. And then with Ricky on the bag, I mean, it's, it's, I've played with those guys a couple of times and it's, it's great fun. You mentioned there Tory Pines, which kind of reminded me that you're living the absolute dream. You know, we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about this. Uh, what are the two or three best courses on the PGA Tour? Uh... Uh, TPC Sawgrass is a fan, is an like, iconic finish, but the whole course is great. Like it's um, you, the whole shape shaping each way is long hitter. Everyone's got a chance. Long hitter, short hitter. I think that's a fantastic test. You have to shape it both ways, and everyone's got a chance. I think the course we play in Tampa, it's called Innis, Innisbrook. The Copperhead in Innisbrook is is amazing, and uh, Torrey Pines South course to me is is unbelievable. The setting and the history and just the whole thing there is just incredible. Yeah. God, it's amazing to be playing these courses because you must have grown up a yeah. golf nut. You must arrive at Torrey Pines and still think, or even you played Pebble Beach earlier this I year. I played Pebble. Yeah. So you yeah, must Pebble. be thinking, you know, I know what Nicholas hit here in the US Open. <laughs> I know what Tiger did here, uh, what, 20 years ago. I mean, that, that, that's one of the great things about golf that you must, you have that back catalogue every time you rock you up at a course. Yeah. Yeah. Pebble's amazing. Um, yeah, you do like the, the 2000. U.S. Open or whatever is, is extremely iconic in uh, I mean, I remember watching it. I was later getting into golf, but I do remember like all the, the talk about that um, was just it was just incredible. It was just incredible. When you say late getting into golf, how late? I the first time I played golf was like 11 or 12. Um, but then I, I didn't really the difference with me, like my it wasn't in our my family or anything like that. So I w- wouldn't have paid much attention to it. I do remember like the Tiger the significance of Tiger winning in 97, the Masters, like I didn't really know what was going on, but I'm, you know, you, you, as I just wrote, you could hear it in like the commentators and other players' voices of that this just was something special about this. So I always remember that. And then I probably wasn't, I was 14 or 15 before I kind of really started getting into it and started understanding it at all. Um, so it's a little bit later, but yeah. Well, anyway, how old are you? How old are you when you shot your first subpar round? Oh, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. I would say 15 or 16, I would say 15, maybe. Wow. There's no hope for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so probably within a year or two, we're taking it seriously. Yeah, I, I, got, I got good pretty quickly. Like, I, I was lucky. I got on um, like in like early Irish panels, like an under-15 panel on Irish, and the, the Munster kind of thing. We're doing the same thing. So I was introduced to people who were kind of helping me along with coaching and that sort of thing. So it was um, that helped that helped me a lot, right? And did someone coach you to get good enough to do that, or did you just go out and play around yourself? 
No, I mean, like, I, I started, I, the, my first favorite, like, David Hayes is a, he's a PGA pro in uh, Dungarvan Golf Club, and we, he would, he had group lessons at a driving range, I remember going there, and then I, me- I remember I went to, first person we got, like, like proper lessons was with uh, Don McFarlane in East, East Cork Golf, Golf Club, and then when I got into the Munster thing, like, I got a lot of lessons in, for years from Fred Toomey, um, but, yeah, that was kind of, yeah. So just got good quick. So like first couple of times you hit a driver, you were thinking, yeah, I, 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 I got the hang of this. The, the first time I played, I, yeah, I remember I was able to hit it okay. Like I, I played a lot of hurling. Um, so I had the wrong, like I had the hurling for a long time. Uh, well, I don't know how long, but for like for a little while. And uh, so I was able to hit it okay. And my brothers and I kind of started playing around the same time. And we all played hurling. So we could all hit it a bit, but obviously the rest of it was, wasn't very pretty. Yeah. We hate you. <laughs> it's true <laughs> we're slaving um, listen thanks so much for doing this it's been great to catch up we no hope result. we'll see you pretty soon so you reckon maybe third fourth week back when the, the, the big names are putting their feet up you'll probably be out there and, and trying to get oh, things going again yeah hopefully yeah I'm going to play the corn ferry the first couple of weeks and then kind of wait and see I, like there's so many unknowns I think there's still there's so much let's uh, I'm going to just let's see um I think a lot of guys are maybe going to watch from the sideline for a couple of weeks and see how it all goes and then kind of decide. But um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully the third okay. or fourth week we kind of get going and get cracking again. We wish you well. Let's check back in at the end of the season. Seamus Power, thanks so much. Brilliant. Thanks, Buzz. There we are, Seamus Power. So that's nice to actually chat up with him properly. Nathan, I'm sure you've had the same experience I've had on Off the Ball, whereby the cell coverage in the States is dreadful. So anytime you do speak to him, it's 10 minutes and <laughs> yes. not a great chat. It's actually great to do that and look forward to watching him now hopefully go well over the next few weeks yeah yeah hope he gets the chances and he probably will because as he's saying a lot of players are going to probably skip more tournaments than he ordinarily would and that when he does get his game that he that he takes it because he is he is a player who generally has good rounds in tournaments it's just probably that little bit of consistency that all those players that are on the bubble um seem to struggle with it's incredible how every player we talk to talks about rory just been so much ahead of everybody else Hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. Hitting shots, I couldn't even think of hitting. I wish, I wish, I wish I had been at one of those West of Ireland's or South mm. of Ireland's. A thousand people following him. I've never gone to watch one of those. Uh, even when we were in Lynch last summer, I was thinking it'd be a lovely thing to come down and do a watch a South of Ireland or a West of Ireland. I must do it sometime. Yeah, was, that, that was that a West of Ireland in was it Ross's Point one year? Ross's Point, yeah. Yeah. When I was working in Galway, there was uh, somebody from Galway was in contention. I remember getting sent up to it. It's a very nice, chilled out, yeah. if the weather's nice scenario. If the weather's nice. Well, like watching golf anywhere. Yeah. If the weather's nice, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Rory is a big test ahead of him this weekend. Cool. How is he yeah. going to make entertaining conversation? Considering Phil and Tiger huh. couldn't conjure up anything of interest for the match. <laughs> Dustin Johnson and Rory McIlroy. Yeah, well, yeah, no, that's... that's you must not nice Spieth. Shot, Spieth and Rory oh, Spieth, would be. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, Rory and DJ hang out all the time. Mm. I wouldn't have really? paired them together no. as, as natural bedfellows, but apparently they do, yeah, over the last couple of years, they have started hanging out, living in the same area, so... These events are weird, but you're looking at the setup for a Sunday night, so it's obviously a sort of skins game as well. It skins a thing over here. Do people... Pl- I, I have never, with anyone... In the last however long, 10 years, I found someone turn around and say, will we play skins? It just doesn't mm. seem to have be a thing anymore, if it ever was here. No, because you might even find yourself playing for a euro a hole or something, and then eight holes in, you've totally forgotten yeah. about how it's all going. Yeah. Yeah. But I, it's true. It's, uh, I mean, I've played skins with friends, but only friends who picked it up from playing it in the US. Right. US sure. yeah. it, it is the classic friends game in America. Is skins. Is it? Yeah. Is so in short, and I don't know all the rules. You, you, so play, you, have, you play each hole, and if you draw the hole, the amount goes on. It carries over. over. It, it rolls over. So it's two euro. If you're playing one euro hole, it's two euro on the. It depends if yeah. So you, you just keep rolling over, rolling over. So I mean, it's kind of an un, a weirdly unfair game where you could keep having holes, uh, or you could win say four holes, and then skins rolled over. All you do is win the one hole worth mm. all the money. And you win all the money, and it's like, it's a, it's not a, it's not a particularly. I wonder if it's not that common in our part of the world because it's not really an accurate reflection of how well you played. It's just more, 
like you you shone when when the money was high. Yeah, yeah, because you could lo- so you could lose the first four holes. Yeah, and then the next four are tied, and then you win the ninth hole, and you've suddenly got more money than the other guy just by exactly. beating him on yeah. one hole. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What they're doing, what they're doing with Rory chance. is, I think it's something like fifty grand per hole, eh? and then the seventeenth hole is going to be worth two hundred grand, and the eighteenth hole is worth half a million. Now, part of this and part of all these charity events, there's very much like a home game side of this. One is playing for one nurse's charity. I know. And the other one is playing for another charity. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think a charity wants to be on tender hooks watching this match. Yeah. I think let's just pick one charity. It's a bit like the chase. It's like the celebrity chase. Like what charity are you raising money for? And it's yeah. like, oh. Um, yeah. No, I, but, and, and as we've said before, is it's like making sure that this money is going to charity rather than, you know, the player's pocket is, is, is an important part of it. But I mean, I don't know when I sit down to watch it, I couldn't care less about the money. Frankly, it means no, I would, I would like, I think the fact Rory is involved makes it more interesting. I'd be interested to see considering the tiger Phil experience we've had <laughs> how dire and dull. Oh, Jesus. Well, the, yeah. Is Rory's force of personality strong enough that he can carry this off by himself? Like Matthew Wolf is doing very well to get in there. Very well, Matthew. You've done incredibly well here. Yeah, I yeah, suppose yeah. At, le- at least they haven't tried to build this as here's the smack talk all week and the build oh. up to it. Like Phil and Tiger said, unrealistic expectations. They're, they're doing is, the smack talk stuff again. Is is there a fourth player? Or is it just the three of them? Ricky Fowler. Oh, so Ricky Fowler. It's, yeah, it's Dustin Johnson and Rory against Ricky Fowler and Matthew Wolf. Oh, okay. We'll watch it. We Even know. Tiger and Phil, well. did you, see, did you see Tiger and Phil's uh, banter last week where yeah. Tiger Phil puts on shows the picture of Tiger putting on the green jacket and then <laughs> Tiger puts the green jacket over. I'm like, who's winning? Is this not a <laughs> is this not a draw here? Oh, yeah, you both have He's one. Got a green dra- you got a green jacket. It's like Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well of course of course we'll watch it because the other choice is the South Korean League. That's it. Oh, the Bundesliga is back. Else. The Bundesliga is back. Oh, is the Bundesliga back this weekend? Yeah. Are, you going, watch, are you going to watch Bundesliga? Like, are we going to do pieces on a Monday night on the Bundesliga? I don't know. Tree? I don't know. I'll, I'll probably watch something this weekend. I'll watch it out of curiosity. It'll be a novelty. Time, well, I'll, I'll watch it out of what's it like watching it behind closed doors. Yeah. Because I've commentated on games behind closed doors and that's not a fun experience. Yeah, it's tough for the commentators. I saw a talk that the broadcasters will give you the option on the red button to have fake commentary played through, but it won't have much correlation to what's happening on the pitch is the only thing. Well, you hear everything. I don't know if you and Aaron was mentioning this the last night. They did a game last season in the Europa League. Uh, I think it was PSV Eindhoven were playing against Marseille and Yetro Willems, the new, now plays for Newcastle uh, defender, got sent off right in front of the two dugouts on the halfway line. And all the microphones are obviously there. Yeah. Call the referee. He has very good English, it turns out. <laughs> he's, got, he's got all the words. All he the Anglo-Saxon all, words. He has all, all the words, including the C word. No. Right. Right. As he called the referee this, as he was being sent off. And uh, you're like, ooh. Should I apologize? Apologies. For that. <laughs> so he's you know, quoting he's, language. It's throwing up lots of funny, uh, funny things. At, at UFC 249, we did a piece during the week with Kevin Ioli. And uh, two different fighters credited Daniel Cormier, who was on co-commentary with turning the fight in their favor, as in they could hear everything. So Cormier was saying things like, oh, he needs to change what he's doing there when he's, uh, he's leading with the left or whatever. And right. the fighters heard this and thought, that's a really good point. Changed their approach and then credited uh, Cormier on commentary afterwards with helping them win the fight. <laughs> so yeah. interesting times. Um, there was one last thing I was going to say. Can't remember. Oh yeah, sorry. It is terribly grim though that some of these golf tur- d- d- tournaments and who plays in them is determined by how badly hit that respective state is. Mm. You know, there's just something uh, very surreal about that. You know, so even Seamus Power there turning around to his family and saying, "Well, I'm going to play in Connecticut because that's uh, nobody else wants to play there. Yeah, nobody yeah, yeah. else wants to play there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There but these are yeah. This is it. All right. Listen, fellas, great stuff. Let's uh, chat next week. Cheers, lads.